you know, I, I mentioned Father's Day earlier. I did want to make sure that you know on your way out, um, this will matter. Um, we want you, because you may not know on your way in, but on your way out, there's a big tree on the wall that's facing, like that I'm facing, that's facing me uh, on the other side of these doors. And it's like this tree that we've put up there. And just like we did for Mother's Day, for every, you know, you'll, you'll fill out petals uh, of, in, in honor of the kind of the mothers and the mother figures and the grandmothers and the stepmothers and the adoptive mothers and all that in your lives. We made a donation uh, to a mothering ministry. We're going to do the same thing today for a fathering ministry called Faithful Father Initiative, Faithful, Faithful Fathering Initiative. And uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a group that tries to raise up more and stronger um, dads in Christ. And so um, if you will, I hope that you will, uh, stop out there and, you know, put a name down uh, for someone uh, in your life. I did that for my father, but I also did it for my uh, grandson's father. You can, you know, anybody that you put out there on, on one of those leaves, stick it up on the tree. All those, uh, we'll count those at the end of the day, and uh, we'll make a donation for each one of those that, uh, that goes from Parkway. We could have given you a bookmark, Dad's. Uh, or something like that, but we figured your, you know, your heart would be as our heart is to want to just um, to raise up more, uh, you know, more and stronger godly fathers. So anyway, so that's what that's uh, that's what that's all about this morning. I hope you'll do that on your way out. Um, I'm gonna invite you, if you would, to pray with me, and then we're gonna get started on a sermon series that's called "The Chosen and the Choice," and we're gonna be talking about some of the some of the uh, some of the identity pieces of who we are because of who God is, and then what does that mean for us as we choose things? So let's uh, let's pray. God, thanks so much for today, and I thank you for these friends. I thank you for this time. I thank you for the gift it is to be able to worship you and to do that together. God, I love the singing. I love to hear the voices uh, gathered together to sing um, these love songs to you. God, we we know that uh, that in some way. Uh, the the prayers and the hugs and the and the songs and the scripture and all of it works together, God, to to strengthen us. So, God, I pray now that you would either speak a word through me, and and uh, or that you would speak a word in spite of me. Either way, God, we want your Holy Spirit to be our teacher this morning, and we pray these things as we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've been out, uh, kind of out of the pocket the last several weeks. Uh, Ginger and I went straight from annual conference uh, to our, and then we took the kids. We went on a family vacation for a week, and then we got back on Wednesday of last week, and then we had our grandson, Weston, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, spending the night and all that kind of fun stuff. And he was sick. I mean, because, you know, I mean, what else do you do with a sick kid? You send them to the grandparents, right? So, um, so, we, so we got to have the sick version of Weston at our house for a few days, and we loved it, and he was, he was sweet, and we enjoyed having the time with him. But we didn't exactly know what he was sick with when he got there. He was coughing and having trouble sleeping, and, and the, the most heartbreaking part was when he, because he's like two, right? So he, he didn't have a whole lot of words to, to, you know, like tell you his symptoms. And so he would just do this. He would just point at himself, and he'd say, hurt, hurt, Papa. Hurt, Juju. Hurt. And he'd point at his face. Hurt. And be like, hurt. And be like, I don't know, like, whatever that is, I'm sorry that that hurts, like, but I don't know what to do for that. You know, like, and then what is, th I hurt. Okay, great. So, and what we, so we didn't know what was going on. It turns out that he had strep, right, which makes a lot of sense. He's trying to tell us he, his body hurt, right? But we didn't know what was wrong with him. And so as the, you know, after a couple of days of being there and uh, him not sleeping well and coughing during the night, we said, oh, we think he's getting worse. So we're going to take him to the doctor. Now, our, our oldest, uh, is his mom, is a nurse, and she works at an emergency clinic in Houston, uh, one of those kind of you know, emergency rooms or whatever. And so we, we took him there because if we take him there, then you know, basically the doctors there kind of write off that expense and they see him for free. So we took him all the way into Houston to see what was going on, and they didn't know what was going on, and they, you know, they said, oh, it's probably viral, but let's, we'll go ahead and test for flu, and we'll test for strep, and we'll do all that, and they didn't have like the little two-minute test for strep, they had like the 15-minute test for strep, okay, and so they tested him, they swabbed him, and did all that stuff, and in the interim, not, then you kind of sit there, and you wait, and, and at the time, we were like, well, we probably don't need to wait for another 15 or 20 minutes just to find out if he has these things, they'll tell us if he has them, and they'll call us a prescription or whatever, so we're getting ready to leave, and, and have I mentioned that, my, that his mom is a nurse? Have I mentioned that? Because I want to make sure that you understand that she's a nurse because it's important to the story that you know that she's a nurse. nurse. Okay, so we're sitting there in the, behind the little screen in the emergency clinic. Don't know what's wrong with him, but know that he's sick. He looks like he feels miserable and all this stuff. And my daughter, who is, by the way, a nurse, she says, 
She looks at him. We're getting ready to leave, and they're going to tell us what happened. She looks at him. If I'm lying, I'm dying. My nurse daughter, who, by the way, she went to the University of Texas Health Science Center. <laughs> she, she, uh, I know at that institution of higher longhorn learning, I know that they must have talked about the germ theory of sickness, right? I mean, this is a mom who will not let her son go out when it's cold outside for fear he'll catch the flu. But in this moment, knowing that he's sick, not knowing what he has, he looks miserable, he's coughing, he's terrible. In this moment, my nurse daughter takes it upon herself as we're getting ready to leave the, the little emergency clinic. If I'm lying, I'm dying. She turns to him and... And right on a snot bubble, she gives him a big mama fat kiss on the lips. Mwah! Now, is it just me? Or is there something wrong with that? Okay. I mentioned she's a nurse, right? Like, she, I know, I think, I, it's the first time since she was probably 16 years old that I just looked at her and like, what is wrong with you? Like, do you not know, like, did you miss class the day they went over the germ theory? Like, that's how that works, right? I know that you don't want him to go out in the cold because he'll get sick, but when you kiss him, on whatever he has, you now have, you know? But she just, that's whatever, just mwah, big old fat, you know, mama kiss on the lips. And, of course, the irony is, you know who got the strep? Ginger. Ginger got the strep. <laughs> not me, not me, no, sir. I kiss him on the back of the head, and then I go um, hand sanitize my lips, Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Kids are sick around me. They, they get this treatment. But, but, but Ginger, she, she loves on him, and she got sick. And Jessica never did get sick. Gave him the big old fat kiss on the mouth. Still didn't get sick. That's, if there's any justice in the world, that should have not turned out that way. But <laughs> anyway, so she, so she and, and I, friends, it, it, it drove, I was like, I was just un, in disbelief. I was like, I, I'm so confused. Like, what just happened? Like, why did you do, why would you do that? Just kiss him on his cheek or, you know, whatever. You might as well just lick the floor in the emergency room, you know. <laughs> but she, but she, and, and so for the next couple of days, you know, I was just, I was just going, why? What, what is the deal? And then I started reading Colossians 3. This is going to be a weird connect, so stay with me. So in Colossians 3, I started realizing something that, um, that well, all of a sudden it made sense to me. Because what I, what I realized was that that's kind of like a mother's love, right? That's, isn't that sort of symbolic of a mother's love? And, and I started reading Colossians 3, and I realized that this is the same kind of thing that's happening here. You see, when Jessica looked at Weston, she, doesn't look at, she didn't look at him as a kid with germs. She didn't look at him as a kid who was sick. She didn't look at him with, you know, as a kid who's got this issue or this problem or whatever. That's not what she saw. What she saw when she looked at Weston that day was she just saw her son that, whom she loved. She saw her beloved son. That's what she saw. And friends, as, as hard as it is for me to admit it, I, I started reading. I was reading Colossians 3, and I was like, that that will preach. I like that is that is the kind of love that our God has for us. That's the kind of love that our heavenly Father has for us cuz when he sees us friends, make no mistake, sometimes we think God loves us, you know, like he must not know us very well if he loves us as much as he does. But the truth is friends, he know, he he is God. Just like I kept saying she was a nurse, he is God. He knows everything about us. He knows our beauty and our brokenness. He sees every inch of our lives. There is nothing that is hidden from God, and yet he loves us with a passionate, pursuing kind of love that you and I could never understand or explain. And I, man, I see, I see that all over Colossians chapter 3, and so I just want to, I just want to kind of go through this here, even on Father's Day, I think it's really powerful to think of as well, but, but just, I just want us to go through some stuff and, and, and see what, what Paul is saying to the, the Colossian church as he talks about um, kind of who God is and who he has said that we are and then, and then some invitations that God makes us, uh, invites us to step into. And the first thing I want you to hear this morning are the givens, okay, the givens. Now, Paul is just, just in the paragraph above this, he started talking to them about things they need to get out of their lives, right? Things they need to take out of their lives, like get rid of this and get rid of this and get rid of this. And then he steps into this whole new paragraph that we are inclined to just use that first, that first kind of dependent clause at the beginning. We're just, we're inclined to kind of set it aside as if it's not that important. But, but what it says is, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Now, we just want to kind of set that aside as if it doesn't really matter. But, friends, that's the scandal right there. 
the scandal is in the dependent clause. So I want you to hear that. I want you to, I want you to clothe yourself with it this morning. These three given words that we see here in Colossians chapter 3. First thing it's, uh, Paul says to the church and uh, the Colossian church is that they are chosen They are chosen people. They are chosen. Now, in the scriptures, who do we typically talk about as being God's chosen people? Who do we, who is that? Right, Israel, right? It's the nation of Israel. It's the Jewish people. And that starts way back in the Old Testament. It starts back with Abraham. You know, God says, hey, Abraham, if you'll go from here to there and do what I say, I'm going to take your little family, and I'm going to make them into a huge nation, and I'm going to make that nation a great nation. And through you, I'm going to bless all nations, right? So that's, that's kind of the deal that he makes with Abraham. That's the covenant that he makes with Abraham. And so Abraham goes and does, and, and, and you, know, you start seeing God. The whole Old Testament is really the story of God's chosen little family who become a great nation and how God is going to use them to bless the whole world. That's the whole story of the Old Testament. And then you get to Jesus, and you start to see that, that, that at the beginning, you know, like, you know, it's like, I mean, this was a little nomadic tribe, a little small nation in the middle of the ancient Near East, the door was open this wide. These are the people who were called God's chosen was a door about this wide. And then you see Jesus come on the scene and he swings the door wide. He swings it wide open because no longer are the chosen people just the people of Israel, just this nation. No, Jesus is making good on God's promise to bless all nations, right, through this little group of chosen people. So here it's, it's scandalous for Paul to say that you, Gentiles, like me and you, that we are God's chosen people. You're, cho- you're chosen. I just, want you to, I just want you to hear that. I just want you to just feel the, feel the beauty of that and the scandal of that, that you are, you are chosen, Parkway. And, and what he means by that, I mean, you know, I, for instance, um, you know, when I was a kid, I was, the, I was um, blessed, I suppose, or, or cursed one or the other. I was the only one in my family who had blonde hair as a kid. And so my, you know, my parents both have dark hair, my brother and sister both have dark hair, and now I have darker hair, but when I was a kid, I had really, you know, pretty blonde hair. And so my brother and sister um, may or may not have actually, you know, uh, on a, a couple of occasions said things that stuck with me as the younger brother, like, oh yeah, well, you're adopted. <laughs> now, as the favorite... I wanted to, uh, but I was still the youngest, and I was afraid they might, like, stomp me or something. And I'm not sure if I ever did say it, but I always wanted to say to them, well, I may be adopted, but at least mom and dad chose me. Because <laughs> they're stuck with you two, okay? That's what I wanted to say to them, but I, that's, that's not, I don't, think I, I don't think I actually ever said those words to them. But, friends, there's something about being chosen. Like, what God has said through Jesus Christ he said, look, the door was open this wide, but always and everywhere the plan was to, to, to create a wider group of chosen people for, for God's love and grace to be made available to everybody. And so if you, if you are in Christ, I mean, God has basically said, you are chosen. I have chosen you. You can sit here today. You can say yes to Christ because you are chosen by God to, to do that. He has offered his grace through the cross to you. And if you have said yes, friend, it's because God has chosen chosen you. You had to do your part, but that invitation was extended to you because you were chosen. It's not because you were, he was stuck with you. It's because he chose you. I just want you to hear that this morning and the beauty of that. And, and then you move on to the next word. The next word is the hardest one out of the three. It's the word holy. Now, there's only two kinds of people in this room this morning. There are the people in this room who, when you, when you hear that God has called you holy, and God called, has called us holy. There's two kinds of people. There's, the first kind of person is the person who looks into their own life and says, God must not know me very well if he's calling me holy. Right? That's the first kind of person. The other kind of person is the person in the room who just elbowed their spouse and said, God must not know you very well if he is calling you holy. Right? Or the kid who just elbowed their parents. God must not know you very well, or the parent who just elbowed their kids and said, God must not know you very well if he's called you holy. So it, this is a hard word for us to hear. It's a hard word for us to accept and to kind of just let sink into us that, that the God of the universe has called us chosen and he's called us holy. Now let me talk, let's talk about what, what does holy mean here and what does it not mean, right? I mean, 
it, what it doesn't mean is that you are perfect, right? If you're not clear on that, just ask the people sitting around you. They will set you straight, right? It doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we're pure. It doesn't mean that we're all that, right? It's, that's not what it means. It doesn't mean that we're sinless. What it means is this, and to really understand the word holy, you really have to understand the cross. So let me, let me give you a, just kind of a, a, a recap of all that and just to remind us of kind of what, why the cross matters. So what, what Christians have said for 2,000 years is that we are sinners, right? That we, that we in, our, in kind of who we are, the ways that we operate, they are selfish sometimes, they are, we're mean, we're impatient, we're, you know, you name it, right? We do things that hurt us, they hurt the people around us, they break our relationship with God. We are sinners, we're broken people. And so it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, but, but yet we want to be in relationship with God. We want to be able to get to heaven, so we, we want to do our very best. But friends, the truth is, if we ever looked at a list of all the different ways that we are selfish and the different ways that we hurt and the different ways that we are impatient and the different ways that we uh, withhold from God what belongs to him, all, I mean, you just name it. You just go to, if you ever saw the list, I mean, you think your Christmas list is long. It's, it's a really long list, right? I mean, it would be a list that would go on for just days and days. And so, and the truth is, there's nothing that we can ever really do. I mean, to ever, to really to make up for that sort of list, friends, it would take a pretty, pretty righteous person. Uh, and I don't know if you, again, know this, but we're not that. And so what Christians have said, and I use this analogy all the time, is, is basically this. Um, so like when we were, when, when all of our kids were younger, we would go, you know, we would go to eat uh, at different times in different places, and when the kids were younger, different ones at different times, you know, if they had a little money in their pocket, we'd get to the dinner table, and they'd be like, hey, dad, can I pay for dinner? I'm like, I'd be looking at the bill, and it's like $65. I'm like, please, bring it on, you know. <laughs> Take it, sister. You, you do it. And so, um, and so they would say, okay, great. And I said, what, how much money you got in your pocket? And so they reach in their pocket, and they pull out like 13 pennies. And I'd be like, that's going to not be enough, right? <laughs> how fast are you? You know, I mean, that's what I was, I was like, how, can, can you make it to the car before, can you outrun the waiter, you know, or whatever. And so, and so, but what would end up happening is, because the bill was more than what the, that child had to pay, right? They didn't have enough money to pay the bill. And so rather than racing the waiter out to the car, I would usually say, uh, I think every time I would say, hey, why don't you, I'm, I'm happy for you to pay your 13 pennies. Why don't you, why don't you let me put the credit card down and I'll pay the rest. Okay. And so they would go, okay, Dad. And so that we would do that, and then we would not have to be arrested. And so, and, and, and so, we, so that's, what, that's the way that works, friends. That's the same way it is with us. We have this really long list of, of, of a debt, of a bill that has come due that we owe God. And we don't have the righteousness to pay for it. Even our best days, friends, our best days, when we want to pat ourselves on the back and say, wow, I'm a generous person. Wow, I'm a kind person. Wow, I'm a loving person. Wow, I'm really a sacrificial person. Even on our best days, compared to what we owe God, friends, it's 13 pennies. And so what Christians have proclaimed for 2,000 years, and the reason God can look at you and look at me and say that we're holy is this. The God of the universe left heaven. He said, there's no way that they're ever going to be able to pay what they owe. And so God said, I'm going to pay it. So what God did was he, he left the perfection of heaven. He came down here. He was a baby. He was a young man. We talked about this last week. He was a, or a couple weeks ago. He's a boy, a young man. He's, when he's 30 years old, he does his public ministry. He lived the perfect and sinless and blameless life. And because he did, as God in the flesh, he both had the righteousness and the right to offer payment on our behalf. And so what he basically says is, this, look, I know that you want to offer your 13 pennies, and I want you to offer your 13 pennies. I want you to do the very best you can. I want you to reach up as high as you can. But he says, why don't you let me put down the righteousness credit card and let me pay the difference on your behalf? And friends, when that happens, when you say, all right, Jesus, I believe, I'll trust that. I'll take that. I'll, I'll, thank you. Right? When that happens, when you say yes to what God is trying to do, he's trying to pay for our own brokenness. When you say yes to that, friends, God no longer looks at you and sees your sin or my sin. He no longer sees a big, long list of a big bill. What he sees is a bill that's on his desk that's been stamped, paid in full. That's what he sees. And from that moment on, friends, he can call us holy, not because we're sinless, not because we're perfect, not because we're pure all the time, 
We're still, we still are working in that direction. God's still making us and, and heading us in that direction, but we're not there yet. But what he sees in us is no longer our sin. What he sees is the righteousness of Christ. It is a gift. So when, when, when you put on a shirt that says holy, or when you look in this and you, on this scripture and you see uh, that God calls you holy, it's not because he doesn't see your brokenness. He does. It's that he's already paid for it. It's that he has paid the debt that was due, and now he doesn't see your brokenness or my brokenness. What he sees is the righteousness of Christ. So now we're chosen and we're holy just because God wants us to be, not because we've earned it. Dearly loved, same thing. You know, when my daughter looked at her son, she didn't see uh, in him this kid who had strep throat. She just saw this kid that she loved. It didn't matter to her. If she ended up getting sick, oh, well, she just gets sick, right? She's just, she's sick, but that's, this is my kid. She dearly loved. Friends, we have that same, this is, this is how much God has loved us, that he would, that he would be, leave the perfection of heaven, that he would come down here, he would be, uh, live among us, right? These, this is incredible stuff. Don't lose it in the dependent clause and assume that the real point or the real meat of this is in the next list. I just want you to sit this morning and just realize that you're chosen. Realize that you are holy. And realize that you and I are dearly loved. That's, we're chosen. Now, the next piece are the choices, right? The next piece is what you can choose to do because you are all those other things, right? These are the things that you can choose to do because you're all those other things. So let me, so let me, uh, let's talk about that. So the next thing he says there is clothe yourselves with compassion, right? Clothe yourselves with compassion. Now here's, the, the deal is, the word compassion, you know, we think of compassion, maybe you think of something like Compassion International or, you know, or, or, or just, you know, just being nice to people generally or whatever. The word compassion literally means, the word passion, uh, kind of in an ancient sense and the traditional sense, means, it basically means uh, suffering. When we talk about the passion of Christ, we're talking about the suffering of Christ, the story that leads up to his death on the cross. So, so compassion means to suffer with. So we're being invited, because we're chosen holy and dearly loved, we're being invited to clothe ourselves, right, to put on compassion, to suffer with. Now, friends, that's a hard gig right there. That's not just um, patting someone on the back or sending them a text when they're going through something difficult. That's checking in with them. Are you okay? Long after everybody else is forgotten. That's sitting with them in their pain. That's listening to them if they want to talk. Sometimes they don't want to talk, but if they do, sit with them and listen. It's, it's entering into whatever it is that they're going through. Not trying to fix it. It's just suffering with them. And friends, some of you are going to say, well, that's not my spiritual gift. I get it. This is not talking about spiritual gifts. This is talking about choices. <laughs> you may not even be any good at this, but God is telling you that he, he's inviting you to choose it, to, to do your best, to even walk into somebody's pain and say, I don't know what I'm doing here, but I love you, and I'm going to enter into it with you. That's compassion. Paul says, hey, because you're chosen, because you're holy, because you're dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. The next thing he says is to clothe yourselves in kindness. Now, it's fixing to get really hot up here on the stage. <laughs> Let me just tell you. It is summer here in Texas. So, kindness. Now, friends, this is a pretty important word because uh, I don't know if you've just like noticed in the world around us, but there's not a whole lot of kindness. I think we lack a lot of kindness, right? Well, one of the things that we have in this room today, and certainly in our community, if we had if we just gathered, you know, uh, ten thousand people from all over New Territory, Greatwood, Sugarland area, Front, Richmond, Rosenberg, whatever, and we just put them all in a room, I, I'm certain if we said, okay, everyone on this side of the line who thinks this, and everyone who thinks this is on the other side of the line, Democrat, Republican, uh, conservative, liberal, um, you know, pro this or anti this. I mean, if I if I just said the word gun control, ready go, and put you on opposite sides of the room, we'd have people, we'd be, we'd be throwing hand grenades before the day was over, right? The, the truth is. The truth is, we are divided in a lot of things. This doesn't help with that, but what it says is you can disagree with stuff and still be kind. What we do is we go to the mocking, 
We go to the meanness. We go to the yelling. We go to the whatever. And I get it. I mean, there are things that we're all passionate about. I get it. That's not, it's not that that's a bad thing, but we can still even do that. We can do that kindly. We can do that in our homes. We can do that at work. We can do that with our kids. Even when we're disciplining, we can discipline kindly. When we, when we uh, are, are dealing with a friend on something that they're going through, we can, we can do that kindly. When we're critiquing, we can do it kindly. Those, there are ways to do those things kindly. We can do it on social media. Have I mentioned that we can do it on social media? <laughs> right? Kindness. We're invited. Because we are chosen, holy, and dearly loved, we're invited to put on kindness, to clothe ourselves in kindness. And then he says humility. Humility is a tough one. Because, uh, I mean, you know, when, we're, when you're right, you're right, right? right. <laughs> but humility just says, you know what? And, and at least the way I view humility is, I could be wrong. Even when I'm pretty sure I'm right, I could be wrong. If there's even, I've been saying this the last several times uh, when I've been doing the benediction, because I think that people can be right and still be wrong, right? We can have the right answer and still be wrong. And I think one of the things that humility does is it just, it, it, the message that you have, if you wear that with just a little bit of humility, it, it can become contagious, in uh, the benediction, the last several times I've done the benediction, I've said, hey, live like this, but do it with just a little bit of humility. Because if you do that, it'll be contagious. Christ calls us to tell the truth, to live the truth, to believe the truth, to offer our 13 pennies, but to do that with humility. Because people can receive it better with just a little bit of humility. We're called to clothe ourselves with gentleness. See my words on kindness. And did I mention you can do that on social media as well? Now we're getting into the double extra large shirts. <laughs> How about patience? Anybody struggle with patience? Yeah. True story, when, I was, when my oldest two daughters were at home, um, they used to say that they couldn't, I, one time they said that they couldn't remember a time when I had yelled at them. I said, well, you guys have really bad memories. And that they knew that I was mad. The only way that they knew that I was mad is when I would say, bull honky. That's how they knew I was mad. I'm like, well, yeah, you don't mess with me when I say bull honky. That's right. And I used to think, because, and, and I, to be honest, I, so, and I, I've talked about my parents before. My, my dad, is, I, he's a great man. I love him. Um, a lot of great things. But, in, but patience was not one of his spiritual gifts growing up either. And so when I was a kid, you know, I, I, he, I, I've told you before, he, he would say stuff like, for crying out loud. And I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that it meant to stay away from dad, right, in that moment. And so, and so patience was something I grew up thinking I, when I, you know, if I'm working with students in student ministry, which I did early on in my ministry, and then when I have kids in my own, I'm going to be the most patient person. I'm never going to yell. I'm never going to raise my voice. And so that was a real blessing for me to hear Jessica and Jenna tell me, you know, you just don't seem to, you don't get mad very often. Um, and then, and that was at a time when I was traveling and doing music ministry and writing and recording CDs, and then I became a pastor. And I'm not saying that pastoring a church is hard, but it is. And the truth is, it's, a, it's stressful. It's, it's a stressful thing. You guys all have stressful things. I'm not, I'm not comparing notes here. But the, but the truth is, um, what I started to realize was that the, the heavier my job got, and, and the heavier life got, and the more kids, and all that stuff. And I'll bet you today, you, if you were to ask Grace and Noah, they probably would not say the same thing that Jenna and Jessica said <laughs> about me never, you know, losing my temper. And the truth is, this is something I have to, I have to work on, um, is, is patience. But I'm invited to, and as a, as a follower of Jesus, I'm told to clothe myself with patience. But over all of them, it says... And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And the kind of love that's mentioned here is the word that's here is agape. And agape is, is a different kind of love. It's the highest kind of love, uh, the highest Greek word for the word love. And the, and the word there is the, is the kind of love that um, God has for his people and that people can have for God. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that says, I'm going to put your needs before mine. It's a love that says, I'm going to love you even if you don't 
love me back, right? I mean, Jesus, when he talks about love, he talks about loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. It is the highest kind of love. And so when he says over all of these put on love, this is not the Hallmark Channel. This is love, the way God designed it to be. It's agape love. It's the highest kind of love. And he says, put all of these things on. Now, real quick, and the bad thing about it, in this room, I don't have a clock, so I have no, no idea what time it is, but I, I just want to end with this. <coughs> Why does this matter? So there's some, there's some chosen things, there's some givens, and then there's some choices. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that God says that we're chosen, holy, and loved, dearly loved? So I'm 48 years old, and my dad... Um, or, and my mom will still sometimes write me a note or an email or leave a message or whatever, or we'll have a face-to-face conversation, and they will say something like, you know, um, you can be anything that you want. And I'm like, well, I'm 48. So I think, you know, my dream of being like an NBA po- point guard is kind of over, right? <laughs> um, that happened, it died at age eight, um, so um, when I wasn't six foot four. Um, so, but, but, but friends, my whole life, that, is, that has been a, a consistent message in my life. You are smart. You are strong. You can do it. You know, those kinds of, those kinds of messages, those were givens in my household. And they didn't always, we didn't always say we loved each other in our house, but my, I knew my parents loved me. They were at, you know, they were at all the events. They were soccer coaches and, uh, you know, PTA members and all that kind of stuff, right? They, they did all that stuff. I knew that I was loved, and I knew that they believed that I could do anything. And friends, when I, when I say, why is Paul saying chosen, holy, and dearly loved, and then why does he follow with this long list of things? It's because I think he wants us to make sure you can't do all of these things unless you have a foundation underneath you of those things, right? You can't, you can't even know how to love. You can't know how to be kind or humble or gentle or any of those things. Those things happen because of who you are. They are outflowers of, of who you are and what God has said. Your identity is not who you say that you are because some of you, you don't feel like you're any of those things because you've had people your whole life tell you that you're not any of those things. But God says you are those things, and because you are those things, you can do these things.